You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by CBOE Live Vol. CBOE Live Vol is the leader in equity and index options trading technology, providing professional and retail traders with the most sophisticated options risk analysis, compliance, and trading tools. CBOE LiveVol offers a broad spectrum of advanced trading technology including the LiveVol X, next generation execution platform, and LiveVol Pro, the new standard in options trading front ends. Visit LiveVol.com for a 15-day free trial today and by Russell Investments, the home of Russell Indexes, which calculates approximately 700,000 benchmarks daily, covering 98% of the investable market globally, including more than 80 countries and more than 10,000 securities. Approximately $4.1 trillion in assets are benchmarked to Russell Indexes. For more information on Russell Indexes and RBX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again to plunge into the depths of all things volatility with Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo, coming to you from the Options Insider Studios here in the Options Mecca of the known and indeed the unknown world, Chicago, Illinois, at least for the foreseeable future. And of course, we produce a lot of great stuff here in the old studios, including a fun little website we call theoptionsinsider.com. While you're there, click on and just get some breaking news from the world of options, get some headlines. Of course, a lot of unusual activity. We love that stuff as well as analysis, what's going on in the market back and forth. And of course, top left corner of that page, you'll see the Insider Radio Network tab, and that is your gateway to all things on our nine years. Yes, this month, it's nine-year history of our network. So literally thousands of programs at your disposal. You can, If you really want to mainline some hardcore volatility and options content, we got you covered. You could spend literally months doing nothing but listening to our content. Uh, if you do that, let me know. I'll get you uh, referred to a nice doctor. But <laughs> you can certainly bite off chunks every here or there as your time allows. And of course, you can find it all the major platforms, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, etc., and so on and so forth, and including our mobile app available, and pretty much all of the major app stores, iOS, Google Play, etc. And while you're there, of course, while you're listening, while you're streaming, while you're downloading, we'd love to hear from you guys. You can do it through the app. You can do it through our website, through all the social media platforms. Just hit us up, questions at theoptionsinsider.com. That works, too. A lot, of, a lot of ways for you guys to get in touch with us. Ask us your questions. Send us your comments about the world, the volatility. You guys, after all, are the reason we do this program. And joining me on the old show today, starting off with the man who's been, been off for a bit, and he gets the uh, Soldier of the Day Award because he's soldiering on to the program, even though he is down for the count, uh, weather, not weather, but uh, sickness-wise. He couldn't even go into work today, but he still managed to show up for the show. That's how dedicated he is for volatility. None other than Russell Rhodes, a senior instructor over there at the Options Institute. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the program, and I'm sorry you're under the weather. I'm not that bad under the weather. I just um, I, I think I'll have about an hour of clarity, and then I'll I'll go back and uh, 
watch CNBC for the rest of the day and, and feel <laughs> as bad as, as what's coming across the I was going to say, if you want to get rid of that hour of clarity really quick, just watch CNBC for a little <laughs> while and you'll be, uh, you'll be as befuddled and angry and overwhelmed as everybody else who's, who's watching and on those programs. Well, uh, you, know, you know how we figure out whether or not to buy – if they announce they're going to do a Monday night program about what's yes, going on. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. all it takes. Yeah. It's that easy now. Market the meltdown. Market Mar- that's that's what it was called. Turmoil. I'm sorry, market turmoil, yes. Yep. I did yeah, see that announced, and I kind of scratched my head and said, CDC. oh, this may be indeed the turning point we've all been waiting for. Clearly it wasn't, because uh, we'll get to that in a bit. But before we do that, that other tinny voice we hear there in the background, listeners, none other than the greasy meatball himself, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com, as well as a few stops along at Climen, uh, Carmen Line, excuse me, Capital. Uh, Mr. Greasy Meatball, welcome back to the program, sir. Volatility matters. Volatility matters. Volatility matters. Oh, geez. There we go. Getting into some local <laughs> hot button issues at the top of the show. <laughs> Let's just get political right at the top. That's always that's always a good way to win friends and influence listeners. Uh, hey, I'm just saying volatility matters. We all know that. <laughs> totally true a and b before we can offend anyone else let's keep on rolling right on into our volatility review it's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world it's time for the volatility review All right, everybody, it's time once again for the Volatility Review. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we break down what's going on, what's catching our eye in the world of volatility today, and there is quite a bit. We are recording this on Friday, January 15th, for all of you playing the home game out there. And, you know, if you were saying to yourself, I'm a little bored with these markets, I'm just not feeling, uh, it's not enough action out there for my taste, for my personal, political, financial inclinations there's not enough going on, not enough vol out there. Well, you know, we got you covered today because, of course, yesterday, market rallying after selling off up a few percent. And then today, you know, I used to joke on the show that the volatility traders and the volatility market was the most schizophrenic market out there. They love it. They got to have it. They got to have it. Oh, wait, they can't touch it. It's burning hot. Get rid of it. Sell it all. Sell it all. Uh, we're seeing that in the broad marketplace right now, which is a little interesting. Of course, right now, as we're recording this, the S&P is off nearly 3%. Yes, 3% listeners, uh, 2.8% to be precise right now or about 53 handles or so the dow off a similar percentage 2.8 percent or a whopping 453 handles and the nasdaq off leading the charge to the downside about 3.6 percent or so and of course all of that downside coming on the heels of course of the big rally yesterday and we even said on option block yesterday even though uh, the, there was a rally and you expect fixed cash to come off because that's how the product works there was still a lot of vol lurking in the marketplace it was very volatile and of course we're seeing uh, the fixed cash getting it back in spades there today it briefly ever so briefly crossed that 30 handle getting up almost to 31 so just just go back a few shows to when we were at the end of december and saying yeah not a lot of vol on the horizon you know maybe 16 maybe 18 maybe 20 if things stay the way they are and here we are flirting over 30 handle now so a different regime we find ourselves in these days china continuing to deliver one two punches to the market seemingly every other day now so uh, essentially they give a one two gut punch the market takes it the next day there's a bit of a rally because we say well it's not that bad maybe some earnings brighten the brighten the spectrum as well yesterday we had jp morgan do some good earnings and a few others uh and then of course the next day there's yet another gut punch coming uh so even though some of the news overnight i don't think it was as terrible as it, as it led on so it's just uh, this crazy market and not surprisingly uh, things like vvix which is of course the volatility of vix off to the races yet again, right around the 120 level right now. As we are recording the show today, got up to about 121. I probably will retest those highs again before the end of the session. And if you've been following land or the volatility of volatility, uh, this is kind of back in levels we saw probably the last time was around all the uh, the Fed brouhaha in the middle of December. And other than that, that's where it gapped up to uh 130 hand 135 i believe in the vvix land so things were rocking and rolling back then too but other than that we're hovering at pretty substantial recent highs out here in terms of volatility of volatility so there's a lot to sink our teeth into uh, we'll give russell pride a place here because a he might uh, he might pass out at any minute 
and B because he hasn't been on the show in a while. Mr. Russell, a lot, a lot to take in here. What in many things to talk about. What really caught your eye in today's and, and indeed this week's activity? Well, the first thing that caught my eye as I as I logged on to check out what was going on right before we got on the biggest uh, biggest block trade in the VIX pit today, and there's really not a lot of them, but it looks like somebody bought the January 20th 35 calls and paid 33 cents for them. Uh, they, they did good. To, they did it when the spot was at 28.10. So they, they did a little bit better than where we are right now. But really the point behind that is that option has one day left to trade. You know, because of the holiday, we don't have anything going on Monday. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if if they're hoping to get something out of this, unless they're covering a short because they're concerned about the three-day weekend and, and we know what can happen over three-day weekends. Yes. Um, you know, I just find that interesting. And it's, it's an outright trade. It's not a spread trade. So, uh, you know, the fact that somebody that, that we're – Moving up, we've got VVIX up around 120 and VIX pushing 30 that somebody would actually come in and buy out-of-the-money calls. And that's actually the second most actively traded VIX option today is those out-of-the-money 35 calls. Yeah, um, Russell, you know what yeah. the other huge trade? Uh, remember that Morgan guy that was buying all, buying the 27s and the 30s and really every vol, vo piece of vol that he could? Uh, he finally came in on this big move today and mm -hmm. unloaded – uh, his 27 calls. He's still sitting on everything else. But there was a period of time where uh, Spoot, where we were down, market was down 40, mm -hmm. and the VIX was up like, you know, barely three bucks because this guy was by himself slamming uh, option volatility so bad that, um, you know, nothing go on. Now, one, once he got done with his 100 grand, they, uh, you know, we started to see some buyers start to bid in, and we actually saw some BDs step in and start to, to purchase that stuff away. But there is, if you notice, we were around 27 in VIX all morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we made a 10 point move from down 42 to up to down 52. But our VIX seller was done. And so they quickly rallied VVIX from about 110 uh, or about 114 all the way up to 120 and moved VIX three handles in uh, short order. You know what? My, you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And then yeah, I was just saying it was pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, you know what's interesting when when you say that because everybody's I think over the past few months been been aware of you know when there's very large trade in VIX, um, there becomes an awareness and we might not know exactly who it is or who, it, who you know we we know where it's coming in from, but remember back I I spent some time in the uh, thirty year bond pit, and whenever Tom Baldwin would be buying or selling everybody would follow him mm -hmm. um and i'm just wondering if, if that's the case here it's like uh oh this guy's getting ready this guy's getting ready yeah. to start selling his options and so everybody kind of sat on their hands and didn't bid things up and then when it looked like he was done all right you know he's he's out of the way and, the, and then, yeah, then they rally after rally that. I just yeah wonder if some big players are starting to have that kind of um I mean, kind of psychological impact. Are you implying sold, mark, market makers would fade a big customer? Sir? Yeah, is, that, is that what you're implying? So not necessarily fade a big customer, but, um, you know, kind of follow them or take what they're doing into account because they've uh, they've been right over the past couple of months. Well, I mean, think about this. He had sold these at all the way down to 155 and they're currently trading 250. I mean, that is how strong of an influence he had. Mm -hmm. on these calls throughout the day i mean he was sim he was single-handedly holding futures back it was it was really impressive and now since then the entire curve has gone wacky and vol's gotten super big mm -hmm. you know you know you got some size behind you you're a bit of a whale when you could single-handedly keep uh, keep the index uh, depressed until your trade is uh, is executed and you're right i'm looking here at some of the numbers Fifty three thousand of those uh, weekly uh, daily now really and well speaking of the daily options we got some interesting material on that i know a lot of you have been asking about that i think some even today i've got some updates for you guys on that a little bit later here in the program what about a vix daily we'll get to that even though these trades here are effectively vix dailies at this point of course they could indeed be closing 127,000 open on those jan 35s and we know our friends closing on the 27s with 100,000 of those going on 152,000 
open interest. Of course, given a day like today, I can't imagine those uh, those market makers out there, Mark, were were too upset about having to buy some VIX premium on a day like today. Uh, you no. can always put that to work in your in your in your portfolio on a day like today. You know, the, the funny thing is, is that uh, and then yesterday uh, in my fund, I'm just I'm just trying to sell a call spread and I couldn't get them to buy option one yesterday. Uh, and now today they're jumping over themselves now that 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 vault dumper is done. They are they're trying to the crowds trying to get everything they can. Well, that goes back to what I was saying before about how schizophrenic the volatility crowd is. You're right. Yesterday, they were they they weren't crushing it a lot, but they were fading it a bit. You know, and of course, the VIX cash coming in because we're going up the curve, and that's how the product works. But you're right. You're you're an example of that. They wouldn't touch your your call spread, and now a day like today, they they got to have it all. You know, it is one of the more schizophrenic markets out there that we've seen in some time. And and Russell, this kind of gets back to something I'm I'm going to work on. We said this before. Uh, you kind of uh, did it a little early here, but we like it here. You you have you have your you have your fingers really on the pulse of the weeklies uh so much so that i think maybe going forward we'll have a little a little segment uh we'll we'll call it russell's weekly rundown how about that maybe i'll even have some nice music made up for it and oh, that you, would be wonderful and you can kind of give us your uh, your breakdown on all things weeklies because they are uh, indeed uh, rocking and rolling out there in the land of all things uh, weekly before we get into some of that stuff about the weeklies and indeed the dailies. Uh, Mark, you mentioned some of this paper going up this week and kind of how uh, uh, they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole yesterday, today. They can't get enough of the vol. Uh, aside from those things, anything else catching your eye out there this week? Uh, oil vol uh, got uh, the OIV, the oil VIX, got above uh, its highs from earlier in the year uh, on Monday. And that was a, uh, you know, I thought, oh, maybe we're getting near bottom. And it turned out to just be a precursor for a total flushage. Uh, which is a technical term, folks. Um, I think we have our title for the episode: "Total Flushage." Fl- total flushage, flush. Try and say "total flushage" uh, five times fast. Uh, yeah, we had just a, they totally flushed the flushed the toilet on those, and uh, Vol got absolutely just spanked. So uh, uh, since then, went from uh, went from about sixty seven. Uh, down to 55, and now it's back to 60. So oil vol maybe is moving uh, more than VIX vol. Vi- you know, uh, VIX still, I mean, really not hold, not able to hold above 30. Uh, obviously, I think if we do get a push into the afternoon, uh, that will change things. But for now, you know, we are where we are. And uh, that is the VIX uh, still sitting, sitting pretty. I imagine it'd be kind of hard to get that total flushage if you're living in Flushing. Flushing Meadows? Yeah, or Flushing Meadows. Any of those. Any of the above would work for that, uh, that ridiculous <laughs> pun that I just threw out there. All right, uh, moving on. Well, actually, before we do that, you mentioned that Vic's not able to hold 30, Mark. I know you and I have chatted about this before. I don't think I've had a chance to uh, get Russell's opinion on it. Uh, you know, Russell, there's this kind of this prevailing wisdom out there, and everyone kind of has a different number when you talk to them about it, about where's that point in the VIX cash where – you know, because obviously a little bit of volatility is good, but too much of a good thing can be a little bit too much for people. Where is that point, do you think, in the VIX cash spectrum where people start to take their ball and go home? It's just too much for them. Do you think it's 30? Do you think some people are in, like, you know, the mid-40 handles? You know, I think Mark and I, uh, we, we've espoused our thoughts on this in the past. I'm curious, where do you fall on that spectrum? Is it now? You think we're hitting it now, and that's why maybe we can't hover above 30, or is it much higher? Um, I think 30 is is a psychologically funny number for for the volatility markets right now, just because we haven't, when we've gotten up there, we haven't stayed up there very long. And, you know, this last spike, I, I, I'm probably not going to articulate this one correctly, but this last spike that we had back in August, <coughs> apparently um, the reversion back to the teens or back to 16 was the quickest we had yeah. ever dropped and you know how short term a lot of traders memories are you know they may start to think that well we get to 30 we're going to be we, you know we can be back in the teens in 5 or 6 days which it was not the thinking you know before we experienced that a few months ago so i think i think 30 right now if and of course that number can always change but unless we hold around there for a little while um yeah, you know, they came in and bought those those uh, thirty five calls when when the market was at twenty eight. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen much of a follow on since, so maybe that's the level where they're a little ner- you know a little they're taking their ball and going home as well, as you put it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that I, there's definitely a uh, there's definitely a feeling. You know, I, I liken it to. I think I told Russell about this. Yeah, the other piece that's kind of interesting is uh, we've seen this movie before, right? You know, the first time you see Halloween, Michael Myers scares you. The fifteenth time, it's still fun to watch, but uh, you know, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis is gonna live, so it's not nearly as scary. And um, maybe that's a little bit of what we're getting here. Um, the the sell-off's been somewhat orderly so far, and uh, the and so Val is, you know, I, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go out on a limb here by saying that I don't think Fix gets anywhere near its interday high. Uh, or it's where did it, where did it close on that on that that flash crash day like thirty eight Russell thirty six. Um, I think I thought we topped forty. Is I that where the, the close was? With I think 40? the uh, yeah intraday I, I, high was fifty three twenty nine. It closed at forty seventy four. Yeah, because yeah. that was the the I annual high I, for for the. For I don't think we're gonna get there. Um, even right. if the market is fifty to one hundred points lower. Uh, I think you're going to see 30, 35 as the uh, as the trade. And I, I can agree with that because it, the, it just feels like even though the the S and P and the RUT both are, if we close right now, this is the worst 10 day open to a year ever for both of those indexes. And you, I think everybody's been prepared for this. You know, yeah. this is the year that they're that 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 they've looked forward to. Um, as being a very treacherous year. Nobody had anything positive going into this year, and, and I think that's why we haven't seen any true uh, appearance of panic in VIX and also why we haven't necessarily seen um, you know, huge, you know, huge hedging trades coming in as we start to see the equity market sell off. It's, I think it's because everybody was already prepared for it. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, do, think, I do think you had a heavily hedged market, and... I mean, we've been talking, we talk a ton about uh, SKU on this, this show. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe part of the reason why SKU is so steep, beyond all the other structural reasons that we get, is that a whole lot of the market was really worried about this coming year and had a whole lot of protection on. Mm -hmm. It's entirely possible that SKU is high because people were hedging. When you and I are thinking alike, I think we're spending too much time together. Oh, I, I agree. You guys gotta Don't stop, tell Lauren. Gotta stop right. hanging out at Stack, the two of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you're right. Yeah, we, we did see, of course, that pronounced uh, quote unquote hedging activity in the upside of VIX uh, towards the end of last year. And we did talk a lot of last year about how uh, puts were fairly, uh, fairly steep out in the S&P. Uh, so people had a lot of protection on already going into this, uh, perhaps accounting for some of the things we're seeing here playing out this year. Actually, before we, we roll off of last year really quick, uh, Russell, last week, we did kind of all of our own personal uh, takeaways, kind of thoughts and things that resonated for us from the year that was 2015. You obviously couldn't make it. I did kind of a quick cursory overview of the article that you wrote, your five volatility market takeaways from 2015. I thought I'd give you a chance now before we uh, wrap up 2015 for good, put in the record books. Uh, you can give us kind of your detailed thoughts after all that is your article on those kind of five key takeaways from 2015. Well, the the takeaway is where we're going to average closer to historical norms, and and I do think there's a, everybody, and it's kind of scary when everybody has the same thinking, but uh, it seems across the board that everybody's aware or, or that we're probably moving from a lower volatility environment to a higher volatility regime, and we kind of need to do that if we're going to maintain the long-term average of the 1920 range. Um, you know, so far this year, we're we're it's definitely holding up its its side of the bargain. Uh, last year, what really was interesting was despite the underperformance of small caps, uh, RVX uh, was relatively low um, compared to VIX, and especially in the fourth quarter, uh, we had never really seen the implied volatility of RUT options uh, go to a discount across the board relative to the implied volatility of SPX options. We had several days where that happened um, last year. I do think I, it, it appears that RVX, despite VIX rallying up, seems to be uh, holding its own and staying at a premium relative to VIX this year. But it's just interesting that the, the, despite the rough fourth quarter, uh, implied volatility for Russell options was actually slightly lower on average last year than the year before. And um, I, I'm thinking that, well, let me, the skew, 
it, it relates to SKU as well. I think the same stories behind RVX and SKU. Uh, SKU was uh, the last two years, 2014, 2015, we've had the two highest averages for SKU. And that uh, you, you can argue the effectiveness of the way we calculate SKU, but it does indicate the relative implied volatility of out of the money puts relative to near at the money puts. And the, there, the feeling is there's been this change in the overall markets. Uh, a policy shift was actually what somebody at a meeting, um, I did a CFA meeting in Minneapolis over the weekend, and somebody called this a, a policy shift that impacts the way the market trades. And it's the uh, stress test that the banks have to, fo- have to pass. Uh, they can't be proprietary traders like they were in the past because of some of the new rules. So the, it's increased the demand for portfolio protection or firm protection against a market sell-off with out-of-the-money SPX puts. And I think that in, in having this discussion, I think that what I we do, actually uh, have um, I'm just looking at the, cash. the SPX I'm options holding up relative to RVX or SPX holding up relative to rut implied volatility again, for that same increased demand that's kind of due to a policy shift. Um, you know, we've we've experienced a lot more backwardation in 2015 than we had since 2011. Uh, so it, I think that's going to become more of the norm. And if we chop around again this year like we did last year, uh, you know, people that, that, that aren't familiar with – the difference between a short volatility ETP like S- like SVXY and the long one like VXX, where if if we chop around enough, both of them can be down on the year. That happened last year. That could happen again this year quite easily. You know, you made a lot of a lot of good points on there. I told you I did a bit of a, a cursory rundown for them for you, I should say, last week on the show. But I wanted to give you a chance to uh, to dive into your own points uh, yourself. You mentioned RVX and kind of the notion that uh, you know Russell, uh, perhaps a little bit interesting to watch compared to the mothership, the VIX last year and we certainly we you know we work with those folks over there russell the show brought to you in part by our friends over there russell and russell indexes and we talked a lot about rvx on the show and kind of uh, looking for some paper out there of late well it seems like the action today is sparking some love for good old rvx we got a 300 lot going up today russell so that's about 5x what we've seen previous open interest highs out there going up some love apparently for the feb 40s uh just lighten it up total of 300 going up looks like paper buying uh in the pre- in around uh 50 55 cents in that price range a few different blocks so so there you go russell and of course uh, rbx hovering right around 32 half right now out there uh, in the cash that one up about five and a half handles out there as well so uh we had to talk about vix upside love all the time apparently russell some uh some rbx love finally coming in there as well that surprised you um no, it really doesn't. I know that there have been uh, volatility players that that keep an eye on RVX. They 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 want to get involved in RVX, but the liquidity um, doesn't allow them to pull the trigger on trades. So I know that that, that there's a desire to trade it. We just got to get you know everybody on board and uh, you know get the get some decent markets in there, and and I think that volume would take off quite easily. Um, I'm actually in the process of doing a, a study on trading RVX versus VIX. And I'm, I'm supposed to knock that out in the next couple of weeks. So we'll, we'll be talking more about RVX as the first quarter goes along. Well, yeah, well, you know, the nice, the Russell's really been the, the big leader in this market. It's been way uglier than all the other indexes. And so it kind of makes sense that, uh, that RVX would start seeing some volume. There should be some, you know, that's a name that, that, you know, everybody tries to lump vol into one one space, and small cap vol is so different than large cap vol. And, you know, the Feb 40 calls for 50 cents, you know, is that really a bad idea? Uh, let's let's just say that they're currently 60 a buck 35. So uh, smart buy. Yeah, it's doing some size out there. 150 X OI. So, hey, that's, so that, is that the, I think that's the entirety of the. Nope, there's a two lot open interest yeah, along there's, with there's that. Yeah, there's two. That's why I said it's 150x the open interest out there. So more power to our friend out there. He's uh, he's he's going to be. 
putting that on for a while. But yeah, we like to see more paper out there in Russell. It was kind of one of our surprise takeaways of last year that, you know, like Russell mentioned with the performance of Russell Ball, also the fact, and there are, of course, a lot of structural issues behind that, you know, market makers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as to why uh, this one wasn't doing more paper out there. Certainly it wasn't for lack of movement in, in the Russell. We, of course, had that brief inversion between the Russell and the VIX, which you think would have attracted some players who like to spread between the two. That was uh, that was a very weird moment in the in the history of those two products. So certainly should have attracted some paper yet for a lot of reasons. It didn't. Hopefully, perhaps this 300 lot early in the year here, a sign of things to come since we're talking about volume. Russell, you, you blew us off last week. You weren't on the program, so I couldn't get my my SIBO answers from you. So I'm sorry I had to go above your head this week. I had to go all the way up to the uh, to your CEO down there. I actually had a chance to sit down with a few of those folks earlier this week for their annual briefing. We talked about a lot of interesting stuff uh, over there and I, I always like to be the, the the jerk who prods a little bit and i had to go back i had to bring up bxst as i am wont to do and because uh, i was curious because we talk here a lot obviously about you know uh, vix weeklies and that's kind of your your ballpark there russell and how they've just been since they listed them pretty much just knocking it out of the park we saw people doing hundreds of thousands of effectively daily contracts just today granted today's a bit of a market aberration, but still, those products are really lighting it up. Uh, and it kind of raises the question of, you know, this time last year, I remember at this briefing last year, we were talking about BXST, and it was kind of a bit of a, a head scratcher as to why it wasn't resonating. So I kind of put it to them as why they thought, you know, VIX Weekly's clearly resonating, whereas BXST, not so much. <laughs> and so uh, they, and they said they had a chance to talk to a lot of their institutional clientele, the people they thought they were actually going to embrace this. And they said, even though it was very similar to a near-term VIX product in the sense of a VIX weekly, there were enough structural differences. And of course, it is in itself a new product. So that caused a lot of problems for them. They have to add it to their systems. Also, a lot of these big funds sometimes have to get approval to use these new products. So that was a huge hassle. So there were a lot of behind the scenes kind of a devil in the details impediments to people adopting this product that was on the surface very similar, but behind the scenes had a lot of intricacies and nuances that were indeed different. It was a different calculation. Uh, so uh, that was kind of, I think, where they found a lot of the problem. And clearly, I mean, clearly there's an appetite for short term ball. We're seeing it right now. It was just I think the nuances of the product weren't what people needed. And they said, hey, if we just take a shorter duration VIX, people already get VIX. They already have VIX approved to trade. They already have it in their systems. Adding a nearer term product is a question of pretty much turning on a few extra weeks in there in your system. Not a heck of a big deal. And that seems to really have resonated. At the end of the day, it's the old mantra, keep it simple, stupid. That certainly seems to have uh, have worked with the uh, with the institutional crowd. Uh, keep a, give them a product, that, more of a product that they already like. It's pretty much a, uh, a no-brainer uh, there overall. Also, some interesting takeaways. We talked about this on the show before, how the fact that uh, VIX options, uh, despite some surges towards the end of the year, if you've listened to the show throughout last year, VIX futures did really well and everything else. VIX options, though, uh, down about 9% on ADV perspective from 2014. And, and you know, if you listen to this show, like I said, we talked a lot. There were a lot of days out there where it was just things weren't lighting it up. Uh, even the beginning of this year when things were rocking and rolling, I, partly because probably a lot of the market wasn't back on the first trading day of the year. Yeah, they weren't ready to do a million contracts in VIX, but still, uh, it was kind of a bit of slow progression. It wasn't until the end of that first week where we started seeing the close to million contracts and indeed over ADV uh, type prints out there from a volume perspective. A couple other interesting nuggets, uh, 9% overall of uh, VIX futures volume now can be attributed to those non-US hours. That was a big deal last year, uh, adding more of those extended hours for you know the Asian and the European markets. And clearly, uh, that's resonating. I think part of that is also driven by where a lot of this news these days is coming from. I'd be curious to see how that number is shaping up over the past few weeks. I'd wager it's a larger percentage now because so much of the news is coming in the overnight session uh, that uh, that's a lot of that's going to be driven by macro events kind of out of the CBO's control, but still about 9%, a fairly healthy one. Hey, they threw out this nugget, Russell, and I kind of made a note of this just to ask you because it sounded, it blew my mind when I heard it. They said, you guys over there at the Options Institute did 400 seminars in 2015. Is, is that A- right and b how the heck is that humanly possible you must have been doing a couple a day yeah i did um 398 of them <laughs> that's why no, you that's were possible. traveling there all four, over the there, place there are four of us so um and this week alone um i have in right now it doesn't count as a seminar but this week alone i've done um four different educational oriented presentations 
So yeah, that's very. I mean, I I I can see that number pretty easily because uh, there are four of us. There are fifty two weeks in the year. So if we do two a week, that's four hundred right there. Is that and that, is that all? Um, that's not actually, all in person. I, that it? number might be low. Is that all in person or are those like virtual too? It's a combination of both. Mm-hmm. I did two in person and two online this week. There you and, go. You and, guys get and, to. Again, this do, this doesn't count as one, but <laughs> this one counts as something. Now, did you include that awesome panel that you moderated? With you uh, know. the panel did not count either. So no. Oh wow. Those are pure CBO. But but um, last year we did 400, and for the majority of the year we had um, three instructors. So I, I think that's why I think maybe that number is a little bit light compared to what we've done in the past. And you know we unexpectedly lost uh, Jim Bittman in 2014 and we really were doing a little bit of scrambling to keep things together in 2015 uh so i think that that number should go up in 2016 no problem you guys Um, get the award for busiest uh, educators out there at least for the time that's a crazy number i saw that i figured i had to give you some props for that on the show here that just that just leapt out at me as a ridiculous number i know i knew you guys were were down a man for a while there too of course jim having some medical problems uh so yeah a lot of a lot of things going on but yeah you guys are cranking it away speaking of cranking away let's we touched on a little bit earlier but let's keep on rolling some of the paper we're seeing we touched on some of the stuff lighten it up out there in uh, in the weeklies I guess really quickly, Russell, I don't, have, I don't have the music ready for you yet, but anything else catching your eye for your Russell's weekly rundown for this week? Um, Gosh, almighty, you snuck up on me here. Uh, the one thing that's kind of catching my eye was um, SKU maintaining a really high level despite VIX hitting a high level. Yeah, VIX is pre- I always think of VIX as kind of indicating the denominator on SKU. And, uh, you know, SKU's still up around 140, which makes me think that uh, the large, you know, that, that there, it, despite a structural change that has increased the demand for out of the money SPX puts, uh, you've, and, and we're not seeing, you know, the volume numbers you mentioned that we would, that we would hope to see. Um, there's still demand for, for some portfolio protection there. But you know what? On the other side of that, if you like selling out of the money spreads when you think the market, when you think the move is overdone, either in RUT or SPX, um, this, this increased, you know, increased angle on the volatility skew to the downside out of the money puts, I think it's given you a lot of opportunity there. Speaking of skew opportunities, we saw some paper going up earlier this week out there in VIX options land that kind of caught our eye. We talked before last year, one of our favorite, I think it wasn't our favorite, uh, you know, ongoing trade of the year was our one by two friend selling one, buying two, rolling and rolling until he finally hit it out of the park there in that August, September time frame. We saw kind of a, a similar play going up earlier this week, or perhaps maybe the taking off of a similar play it was the VIX 22 uh, excuse me, 2230 in the Jan time frame, one by two going up 113,000 by 226,000 times buying one, selling two. So the opposite of what we normally see, which kind of bring, brings down the question of is this opening or is it perhaps closing of an earlier short one by two? Again, one of our one of our favorite plays from last year. Mark, we kind of put you on assignment to do a little digging into this one. And you kind of uh, came away. People in the pit couldn't really uh, couldn't really ferret what was going. On. I don't remember the first part of this going up, which le- lent you to think maybe it was closing. Have you have you made a determination since then which way you're leaning on this one, opening or closing? I still think it's I think it's an open. I think it was somebody taking advantage of what they thought was high vol and trying to do the old one by two trade. And, and that, it, you know, it's not working that bad. If you look at what he put up, that was a huge trade. But uh, nobody could seem to nobody seemed to think that it was a close. So that's uh, that has me thinking. You know, maybe it was uh, maybe it was an open. Yeah. I think I think the open interest on the 30s was not great enough for this one to, to have been a closing transaction. Uh, it, uh, it was or, so, or the 22s. I can't remember which one, but I did a blog on this w- one, and I and I looked at you know the open interest, the change in open interest, and it didn't look to me. I mean, I. It, I didn't have a chance to run down to the pit and talk to those guys because that I wrote it up the day that I was out of the office. But um, I, I kind of agree with you. I think somebody was opening something up. Yeah, I do think they were were leaning toward the downside. That's what I would be doing if I had put this trade on. They could they yeah. were going to be under twenty maybe or something like that next uh, week on a settlement. Yeah, I, I thought he what he was trying to do was doing that the old decay play, thinking mm-hmm. VIX is going to stay around twenty six, sell the thirties long own the 30s and uh, short the 
or uh, own the 23 short the 30s for like a dollar and then just let the let the the spread expand. Mm-hmm. That was my interpretation, but I could be wrong. Yeah, we're flirting, obviously, with that uh, short strike. Now, looking here today, 50,000 going up on those 30s, uh, about 321,000 uh, open. So it looks like our friend uh, there perhaps still uh, still rocking and rolling out there on perhaps indeed opening out there on those strikes. So, yeah, the reverse one by two coming in and a bit bit well-timed as long as you don't get that uh, that August-type spike to uh, the 40s or 50 handle. Our friend here will probably be looking pretty good uh, and this in this range or so. Uh, right around here interesting stuff that's kind of probably some of the paper that really caught our eye this week overall the strikes that were uh, lighting it up not surprisingly we just talked a lot about them indeed the uh, the jan 30 is taking the number one spot for the top 10 hot strikes this week with about 335,000 open then it falls off a cliff to the number two with about 200,000 of the jan 28s followed by about 193,000 jan 22s and uh, number four, Jan 29's, 156,000. Number five, halfway down, Jan 27's, all Jan, all calls until he get pretty much near the end. Uh, number five, the Jan 27's, 153,000 contracts all the way down. Number six, Jan, oh, excuse me, Feb, get Feb on number six for uh, 35 calls. The ever optimistic 35 strike, not looking as optimistic this week as it did a week ago. Uh, 145,000 of those bad boys opened in the Jan. 25's 145,000 as well. So pretty much neck and neck there. Number eight, the Feb 30 calls, 136. And all the way down, number nine to find the first put on the top 10 list, the Jan 16 put. Remember we talked about those uh, last episode. A lot of put love on that strike in particular. About 128,000 open there. Followed up at the end by the Jan 35 calls, about 127 thousand open there as well and mark we discussed uh, earlier in the segment there kind of what's been going on out there in the land of crude you know we've said on this show in recent episodes that it seemed like they were kind of testing the lows it seemed like it, oh, it didn't seem like there was a lot of potential really for to vol to go that much higher out there in, in crude land yeah that's exactly what we have seen out there in the subsequent weeks and subsequent episodes uh, oiv and vvix uh, or excuse me v, uh, oiv and ovx uh, gapping up uh, pretty hard uh, earlier this week. We saw OIV getting up to about the 67 level inch a week, which is uh, pretty relatively high. I mean, we've been flowing around the low 50s for the better part and into the 40s even for the better part of the past few months. And so we're getting high up there again, which is pretty impressive to see given the fact that we're we broke through the 30 handle today out there in uh, some of the big uh, benchmark products. So it's pretty impressive to see Vol still has the potential uh, to keep going up, even at these historic now, historic low levels. And it kind of, again, puts uh, puts the what we were talking about a few months ago here in perspective, that people were still lining up to buy downside. People were still lining up to pay a premium to buy puts out there in WTI and in the Brent all the way out till December of this year. And it, and it seemed kind of like an aberration at the time. People would want to hedge that far out and that far down. You're talking 30 strike. You were talking 25 handle. I mean, way down there strikes that didn't really seem relevant not that long ago. And now in uh, hindsight, they look like geniuses out there. So a lot of things kicking off uh, out there. Anything else catching your eye out there in the land of crude or perhaps XLE or USO? I know you like to play in those as well. Nothing in particular or other than... You know, uh, the one where that's been kind of under the radar has been Gold Vol, actually, uh, which is catching a little bit of a bid today. But it's been uh, of the kind of pieces that have been interesting. It's been weak. And the other one, TY VIX. I mean, how is it possible that the tenure can be flying around like this and 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 you're really not getting a lot of volatility? I mean, look at the movement in the tenure. It's been impressive. Uh, and look at the movement in bonds. And, you know, that's been the place to find cheap volatility has been in in uh, bond holdings. Yeah, we, we don't haven't really had a chance to talk a lot about uh, the TY VIX and some of the other uh, treasury volatility things that are afoot out there. Maybe we'll have to squeeze them into some future shows but there's so much cooking in the main in the main vol realm as well as some of the the commodity products that uh, it just uh, it sucks up all the oxygen in the room speaking of sucking up the oxygen we can keep going but want to make sure you guys get some time to ear your ear your voices ear your grievances here on the whole program so without further ado let's roll on into the volatility voicemail <laughs> It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. 
It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL. Posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the Volatility Voicemail, of course, a portion of the show where you guys get to take the reins with your questions, your comments, your insights, your festivus airing of grievances, all of, all of the fun stuff we love to hear from you guys. Let's kick it off here with a multi-part question here from Nick, Nick B. He writes, hello, Mark, and greetings to the team on Volatility Views. I very much enjoy your program and have learned much from you and your guests. Well, glad to hear that, Nick. Uh, he goes, I have two questions for you guys to mull and hopefully answer on a future episode. Number one, this is kind of the, the old standby. I don't think we talked about this one in about a year or so on the show, so maybe it needs a refresher. He asks, say, number one, do you guys use trading days or calendar days when calculating volatility? That's an easy one. And then number two, uh, this is kind of a theme. People have been writing in about this, which we'll get to. Doesn't it seem logical to add some sort of daily volatility product to the VIX universe? Uh, the weeklies do well, and most spot VIX products have failed, a.k.a. the you know the VIX up, VIX down. We talked about a lot on the show, listeners. Uh, he goes on to say, but a daily VIX option would track the future, ca- future slash cash fairly tightly off topic <laughs> off topic ps so you guys is caught up in the making of a murderer show as i am a lot to unpack there let's get to the daily one first because that actually hits on something uh, like i said russell you missed the show last week we had a question from t cruz last week almost the exact same question will we ever see uh, a daily vix option and a lot of us here kind of pontificated on the show about you know i said that there's there's Something's coming in the short term. It's just natural, particularly given the numbers you saw last year. The industry was down 3%. One of these, I'd imagine one of the smaller exchanges who has smaller market share, has less to lose, will try to push the short duration regime into the daily realm sometime in the next couple of years. Whether or not it's going to be VIX, I didn't really think so. But we we saw today paper going up that was effectively kind of like a daily. So uh, we're seeing a lot more of that. So that led me... Uh, since I couldn't pick your brain on it last week, Russell, that led me to pick uh, pick uh, your your CEO's brain on it this week. And I asked him this directly. I kind of I cheated. I gave him a listener question instead of my own. And I said, hey, what are, we're seeing all this paper out there in like the last couple of days, 24 to 48 hours of some of these products at lifespans, which are effectively getting close to, to dailies. Does that lead, you know, to, pe- to you to think maybe there is some sort of room for a VIX daily? And, you know, whenever I've asked this question in the past about anything daily related, particularly at the SIBO, they seem to be the most most reticent about it, about embracing anything that short term, because it had such a gambling connotation to it, they would always, knee jerk reaction was always no. And I kind of expected that answer. And I was kind of surprised when uh, Ed Tilly, your CEO, Ed Provo, your, I think your chairman, uh, both were, were much more receptive to the idea than I ever anticipated. Maybe not in the way uh, T. Cruz and uh, what was it? And Nick here asked about, they're kind of envisioning a, you know, a product that opens at, you know, around in the morning and, and ends that night and settles and has that one day of lifespan and that's it. They didn't seem that receptive to that idea, but more of along the lines of perhaps expanding upon the weeklies. All right now we have the weeklies, they list, you know, one day of the week, they settle a week or so later and, you know, they have that product and you have that kind of one expiration to go with, but maybe expanding that. So maybe having a Monday week and then perhaps a Tuesday or maybe some other they didn't illuminate which days and how many they would do off the bat but they seemed very open uh, to that idea which kind of surprised me so I think long answer to your questions here T. Cruz and Nick is that we may indeed see some effectively daily VIX products because at that point if you have multiple weeklies going off then pretty much every day there's an expiration at that point so you effectively have added uh, a daily even though you get a full week to trade it you effectively have added a daily so that's what you want you can come in if those products list. You can come in that morning, and you, you're always going to have a daily popping off somewhere. Uh, so that might be – that kind of surprised me the, how open they were to that, and that made me, made me laid to believe that perhaps we'll see that uh, this year, sooner rather than later, which kind of uh, surprised me. Uh, so I guess, Russell, this is your neck of the woods. We'll let you go first. Uh, a – well, let's answer the first one first. That's pretty easy. You know, the old 250-odd or 365 days for vol. And then B, what's your thoughts on a, on a daily VIX product? Um, the 250 or 365, I usually adjust when you get within a couple of weeks of expiration to down to 250 from 365, but I actually only like to trade in that time frame, So I'm always using 250. 
Uh, that's uh, that's I have just always done that. I also, uh, when I run quantitative studies, I, I don't want things to be screwed up with holidays and that sort of thing. So I, I always stick with um with with the two fifty two actually, which is the uh, most common number of trading days in a year. Um, whenever my intern tells me they got nothing to do, I make them go count the number of trading days in each year <laughs> for the last twenty years. Interesting, a bit of an outlier on that one. We'll get to that yeah. in a minute, but let's talk about the daily thing first. Okay. We're running up against the, da- it. the daily thing. I got a lot of. I've had a lot of thoughts on that. And let me preface this by, and nobody that's listening is allowed to steal this idea. So I'm, uh, there's a lot of trust here, but I know there's a lot of love here. Um, I, you know, I, I'm working on a PhD, and my dissertation area is actually new listed derivative products and why some fail and some some um, some succeed. Most fail. So I've I've got a lot of uh, you know I put a lot of thinking into this one, and uh, you know you mentioned VXST earlier. The I think the reason VXST didn't work out was because there was too much of a behavior change. And if you have a slight behavior change like weeklies, that that works. Um, for daily VIX options, the hurdle with that is what do you settle them into? Uh, you know, VIX settlement is, and in, in, I don't see this changing, but VIX settlement is AM settlement 30 days prior to a strip of options settling. So I don't think we can do anything shorter dated in VIX than we are right now, um, unless we were to do something in SPX. And I don't really know anything about, I, I don't know anything about that. So, uh, it, and, and if you think back, uh, remember when we made a swight, slight tweak to the VIX calculation and we started using um, the non-standard expirations instead of the instead of two standard third Friday SP, SPX expirations to calculate VIX. That was a first step toward VIX weeklies. So I think if the, the first thing that will happen if, if we start moving to shorter dated VIX options than what we have right now is uh, something would change in the SPX pit or the SPX arena first. And then one last thought along these lines, and because I, I know we're running low on time, but um, I've always felt that we should list options on individual equities that expire the session af- the session where it reacts to earnings. For instance, um, you know, today is not a very good example, but next Tuesday, Bank of America reports before the open. And I think it would be great if we had Bank of America options that expire on the close Tuesday so that you could purely either hedge or speculate on an earnings announcement. That was kind of the plan with the weeklies, right? Just kind of use them for that well, they have, uh, use that's, case. That's what they're used for. That's that's what I spend a lot of time paying attention to with respect to weeklies is the the earnings announcements. Yeah. Uh, but if you if you even take you know put less time decay or less you know time uncertainty in there relative to your view with um, with an earnings announcement. Uh, I think that would be the first place if you wanted to get some demand right off the bat. I pity the poor intern who has to do the scheduling for that because inter- <laughs> earnings estimates are uh, – earnings release dates are a bit fluid. So you'd have an option on Tuesday. Wait a minute. It's actually Thursday. They moved it, and you know, yeah. it, would be, it would be a scheduling nightmare. But I think it's an interesting idea uh, nonetheless. Mark, any thoughts on this? We talked about it a little bit last week already. Do you have any additional thoughts and maybe the way they're thinking about potentially laying it out in the future, which would be essentially additional strips of weeklies? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to do that with it that way. Otherwise, you're going to have. Remember when they first had the weeklies that, you know, they would people would just rush in and try and dump them, uh, dump the time premium out, and and it turned into this weird race, and weird and they made them very difficult to trade. Um, so yeah, you would need to do them in, in that light uh, with weeklies with differing expiration days would be the way to do it. Uh, I don't think you can just list something one day that expires the next day. I don't think that'll work. Yeah, the, certainly the uh, Bix Up, Bix Down people would <laughs> may have some interest in that. Uh, his, his last part, uh, we caught up in the making the murder. <laughs> Actually, good timing on that one. I did. I got sucked into that last night, of all things. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in that rabbit hole. As much as I try to avoid it, it seems like it's impossible to avoid uh, in the post-serial world. Uh, there's a million uh, true crime things. This one actually is pretty good, though. So uh, interesting stuff. Uh, good questions. We'll have to leave them there, though, as we move on into our final segment, The Crystal Ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. 
Well, we are in some uh, perilous times. It's always pretty perilous to get into the crystal ball segment because you never know where, what the week may hold for you ahead. These are especially perilous times. Markets moving up and down about 2% a day. Uh, that makes uh, pinpointing seven days from now a bit of a crapshoot. Uh, but we did kind of preface it at the beginning of the show there, talking about where uh, the highs were in terms of uh, where we saw the spike last week, last year, I should say, uh, on August 24th. So, Mark, maybe I'll let you kick off first because you were talking about that kind of being your your upper band to your estimates. You're, you're thinking maybe somewhere no higher than 35 this time next week? Yeah, I mean, unless we really see a – the only way we're going to break out is if we have a true kind of gap-type open that's, that's truly ugly. Uh, and like I said, I, I think people were positioned. And, yeah, 35 is probably about my top level where I think things could go. Mr. Russell – where you're feeling all in the VIX, and maybe if you want to go with your namesake, Russell Ball as well, go for it. Uh, I think they both top 40 by the end, of, but you're going to get me to the end of the month. I think we haven't seen uh, a true frightening capitulation yet, and uh, I don't think we bottom out in the equity market till we see that. So I think it's going to get worse. I just don't see how my, my thought is that I don't think VIX is going to eclipse where it was the last sell off. That's my guess. So we got a vote for 35. We got a vote for 40 but by the end of the month. So kind of doing a little bit of a uh, little bit of hedging there. So those spots taken. So I'm going to lean in kind of this range right around next week. I'm going to say 30, maybe a little bit above 30, 31 or so, 32 range, but nothing really beyond that. I'm going to say we kind of uh, will have some more of these vacillations over the course of the next week, enough to keep us at these relatively inflated levels. And then who knows, going out by the end of the month, maybe perhaps uh, Russell's on the right track with a more of an upside spike but we are starting to flirt in that territory where people start to consider taking their ball and going home so uh, hopefully it's a, it's a short-lived spike to that upside because uh, too much of a good thing can be a little perilous but we'll see we got of course we have a, a long holiday weekend coming up and we all know nothing happens over a weekend so uh, we'll pay attention to that but unfortunately that's all the time we have for this episode of volatility views but before we go as always and check back in with my cohorts here my partners in crime see what they have cooking that may interest you starting off with you mr greasy meatball what's cooking in the land of option pit as well as carmen line you know we uh have a uh webinar coming up uh or a uh, a special saturday class next saturday the 23rd uh adjusting positions and managing risk Uh, If you are a option trader and you really want to learn about adjusting positions and managing risk in a way that a professional trader might, uh, go to optionpit.com slash risk. You know, my my attention is shifting from VIX to uh, weeklies and earnings. We've got about 30 stocks with weekly options available that that start reporting or that report next week. And... uh, Netflix, which is always a lot of fun to pay attention to, is Tuesday after the close, and we've still got some of the big banks to go. I know some of the big banks went today, and it didn't; it wasn't taken particularly well. But I, I kind of spend two or three weeks where I, I focus more on on earnings season than VIX, and we're just about to get into that. I like that weekly focus. It's going to go well with your new segment, Russell's Weekly Rundown. <laughs> uh, I'll get the music going for that. <laughs> It'll be good. So be ready. Next episode, perhaps, we'll unveil the right. uh, Russell's weekly rundown in the meantime listeners unfortunately that's all the time we have so on behalf of mr greasy meatball and indeed russell who is nicknameless yet maybe maybe mr weekly we'll see (laughs) and of course myself i want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading streaming subscribing to the show no matter how you get it and of course for sending in such great questions keep them coming we love to hear from you guys and we'll see you next time for more volatility views Volatility Views is brought to you by CBOE Live Vol. CBOE Live Vol is the leader in equity and index options trading technology, providing professional and retail traders with the most sophisticated options risk analysis, compliance, and trading tools. CBOE Live Vol offers a broad spectrum of advanced trading technology, including the Live Vol X, next generation execution platform, and Live Vol Pro, the new standard in options 
demonstrating front ends. Visit LiveVol.com for a 15-day free trial today. And by Russell Investments, the home of Russell Indexes, which calculates approximately 700,000 benchmarks daily, covering 98% of the investable market globally, including more than 80 countries and more than 10,000 securities. Approximately $4.1 trillion in assets are benchmarked to Russell Indexes. For more information on Russell Indexes and RVX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.